Welcome. My name is Ariana Childs Graham, and I'm with the uh, Global Health and Development Program at the Aspen Institute. We're delighted to welcome you here today. The Aspen Global Health and Development Program is committed to the intersections of health, development, and poverty, and looking at breakthrough solutions. We're really delighted to have this uh, exquisite panel of speakers with us here today to have a conversation that really pushes at the edges of all of these intersections. Um, and you know, if if the um, the meetings in Lima, Peru in December, of COP20, um, and thinking forward to Paris next year on your agenda, and you're interested in, in learning more about the work that the Global Leaders Council for Reproductive Health is doing, we're happy to talk with you after this conversation. Um, the Global Leaders Council for Reproductive Health is a group of um, 16 uh, global leaders that are really committed to looking at how reproductive health and meeting the needs of women and girls around the world um, is an important conduit for achieving a whole host of, of global development goals, um, and that will certainly be a part of the, today's conversation. Uh, um, there's also a relationship with the, between the Global Leaders Council and the Food Security Strategy Group, which is also housed at the Aspen Institute, um, which looks at the complexity and severity of food security and the geopolitical, humanitarian, market, and environmental challenges it poses, um, really looking at both the, the long-term global systems approach of understanding. Just a, a little bit of housekeeping and to talk about how um, this conversation will run. Um, one of the things that, that we um, particularly enjoy doing at the Aspen Institute is, um, of course, having some formal remarks and um, is an important way of teeing up a conversation, but we really like to dive into the conversation, um, both um, having an exchange and a robust exchange among the panelists that are up here, but also with you. So um, to, to get your conversation, uh, your questions ready, and, and we look forward to hearing um, what um, is on your mind and, and where you'd like to take the conversation as well. I'd like to introduce um, our moderator today, Sandeep Patel is the um, Senior Program Associate with the Environmental Change and Security Program and the Maternal Health Initiative at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Also a great friend and colleague in thinking through many of these questions and, and challenging issues. Um, and I'll turn things over. You have um, bios um, in front of you for all of the speakers and panelists so we can go ahead and, and dive into the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Ariana. As she mentioned, my name is Sandeep Patel, and I'm a senior program associate with the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Wilson Center. And there I help manage a cooperative agreement we have with USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health to look at the intersections between health, environment, livelihoods, population, and security. So the opportunity to moderate this panel today um, comes with great pleasure. And actually, I think it was just in June that I had an opportunity to travel to El Salvador and work with the mission there around climate adaptation and they had a specific interest looking at food security so I was able to really talk about voluntary family planning services and um, the impact that has on f food security efforts moving forward so this panel um, is near and dear especially after just spending um, after being there just a few months ago talking about this in the Latin America Caribbean region so I'm not going to take much longer talking um, oh I appears I touched something um, I'm not gonna uh, spend much more time speaking. I want to do uh, to direct your attention to our esteemed panel today. I did just want to take a minute to build off of some of Ariana's comments. I'm sure everybody in the room already knows that the 20th Annual Conference of Parties, or COP20, to the 1992 UN Framework for the Convention on Climate Change will meet in December in Lima. I imagine some of you will be there as well. And there, there's an expected outcome of a draft agreement um, to take the deadline summit in Paris, uh, which also Ariana referenced, um, to create a new climate agreement. So what are the priorities emerging forward? We hear a lot about resiliency, you know, but what does that mean exactly? Are we talking about helping communities mitigate, adapt, or recover from stresses? Are we talking about adaptation in particular to the impacts of climate change? Are we talking about reducing chronic vulnerability? And how does this all relate to climate justice? So those are some of the questions that we're going to be tackling in the next hour and a half or so. And we have rep a vast representation here today, from ranging from UNFPA, USAID, UNDP. And everybody's going to talk about the various ways that food security and access to voluntary family planning services relates to sustainability and resilience today. So this, in this conversation, we're hoping to identify priorities regarding reproductive health and food security in relation to climate change at the COP20 meeting in Peru. So we're going to first hear from 
Dr. Suzanne Petroni, and I do know that you have bios um, in front of you, so I don't want to take too much time talking about people's extensive um, experiences, but she's the Senior Director for Gender Population Development at the International Center for Research on Women, and she's going to give us a bird's eye view of population, food security, and women's empowerment. More specifically, she's going to talk a bit to us today about how recent stories on food security have given po the population to be projected at 9 million by 2050. But what role does voluntary family plan access to voluntary family planning services determine in future population growth? So Suzanne, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sandeep, and, and thanks to Ariana and the uh, Aspen Institute for inviting me to participate today. Um, yeah, bird's eye view of population, reproductive health, and food security in five minutes. Um, this will be easy. <laughs> let me let me start with this presumption of the f of reaching nine billion people uh, as a global population, as we keep reading about and hearing about. And it is a presumption. It's a projection based on many factors. Um, and we actually don't know where we'll be in 2050 or 100 years in terms of global population. Some of the factors that contribute to global population growth and where we might be, uh, of course, come down to access to family planning. Um, there are 222 million women around the world right now who want but don't have access to modern methods of contraception. So certainly providing them with that access and making sure that they can decide on their own whether and when to have children is a critical component of determining how large their family sizes are, which in turn contributes to how large their communities become and global growth. But it is by far not the only factor that we have to take into account. And there's a long history um, that shows us that contraception alone is not the only factor that will contribute to what size our population uh, may be. And so I'll take just a few minutes to talk about that. Um, I want to go back to a couple hundred years ago, a um, guy named Thomas Malthus in London, England in the late 1700s was probably the first person to publicly suggest that having fewer children was actually good for our planet and was advisable. His theory, of course, was that if population growth was exponential. So if one couple had four children, and each of those four children had four children, then four leads to 16, leads to 64, and you have this exponentially growing population. But at the same time, if our natural resources are finite, the, the world won't be able to keep up with the needs of this growing population, right? Because food may grow incrementally one or two or three. So he argued that if we're going to continue to grow at this rate, that populations would inevitably fail. Society would fail. We'd have famine and hunger. Um, but the fact is, during Malthus's time and for a long time afterward, and even now in many developing countries, couples do have large families, four or five or six children, partly because children didn't survive through infancy and childhood to be able to grow up and help the family on the farm and contribute to the family's well-being in their old age. So for many years, no one listened to Malthus. They had four or five children or six, and we had this population growth happening. Now, jump ahead 150 years or so to the middle of the, the 20th century with tremendous advances in technology and science and medicine and the Green Revolution, which tremendously changed the agricultural output that existed, we had a few factors taking place. You have continuing population growth because of this exponential factor, but now you have longer life expectancy. You have more people on the planet living longer, and you have food to sustain them. So. In the middle of the 1900s, governments began to look at this and question, what can we do about this? Because we're on this path now to this exploding global population. So they began to invest in developing and disseminating contraception worldwide. And what we saw was that, in fact, since the 1950s up until now, the average child, children per woman, the total fertility rate, has declined significantly from about five children per woman in the 1960s 
to two and a half now. And of course, this could not have happened without access to family planning. But it also couldn't have happened without access to girls' education, so that girls were staying in school longer and realizing that they had opportunities outside of being a wife and a mother. It couldn't have happened without social norms changing to allow women and girls to engage in their societies and to go into the workplace. It couldn't have happened without economic opportunities so that when girls graduate from school, they can go into the workforce and delay having birth. It couldn't have happened if we didn't have changes in the huge high prevalence of child marriage. Um, we still have a tremendous number of girls married before the age of 18, and we know that if girls marry early, they are more likely to have children early and have more children over their lifetime than girls who marry after the age of 18. We know that when girls stay in school, um, that they'll have fewer children over their lifetime. So all of these factors come into play. Um, and, and so it's important to recognize and respect the role of women and girls and empower them. And that's particularly true in agriculture. And I'll just wrap up on this point that women, in, women represent 60 to 80% of the world's agricultural workers but they only own a teeny percentage of the world's agricultural land. If women were given the same, the same inputs, the same training, seeds, fertilizers as men, agricultural yields would increase significantly, up to 30% in some communities. So women need to be at the table. They need to be respected. Their rights need to be involved in discussions around food security and population and climate change. and we would urge every decision maker to make sure that when they're talking about these issues, they involve women in the agenda setting. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, listening to some of your comments, talking about girls' education, uh, having increased access to education and less child marriage certainly uh, resonated um, as c comments that are similar to conversations we're having around demographic dividend as well, that it's not um, just as simple as contraception. There's other things that need to come in into place in, in communities. So thank you for setting the stage and, and also then taking it down to the level of us thinking about women and agricult as agricultural workers and the impact that has on food security discussions. So now I want to direct everybody's attention to Lucy Wanjiro. She's a program specialist for gender and sustainable development at UNDP. And she's going to talk to us a little bit more about COP20 and how it fits in at this particular moment in time as we are also determining the priorities for the post 2015 development agenda. And she's also going to talk to us a little bit about what happened, I guess it was just about two weeks ago, and in New York at the UN Climate Summit and on the other discussions around the UN General Assembly. So thank you, and we're looking forward to this. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. <clears throat> I just want to say I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I thank the organizers for inviting me. and. Um, and I look forward to our discussions after this. <laughs> so really, uh, we are indeed at a pivotal moment for international development. As the world develops new priorities for sustainable development goals that will follow the Millennium Development Goals or the MDGs, two other international uh, development uh, agreements will also be agreed in 2015. These will be the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, uh, agreement, which is a primary international intergovernmental forum for negotiating the gr global response to climate change. Uh, additionally, there will be an agreement in 2015 uh, that will take place on disaster risk reduction. So, uh, and it will, it will, it, it, this will be adopted, uh, which will be adopted at the wo Third World Conference for Disaster Risk risk reduction in March in Sendai in Japan. So 2015 is really going to have a lot of global uh, negotiations and agreements around climate change and as around disaster risk reduction and around sustainable development goals. 
A global climate change treaty is essential to ensure that vulnerable communities have what they need to address climate change challenges and achieve sustain sustainable development. Uh, the first milestone towards this agreement will be the COP20, which has been mentioned, the Lima Climate Change Conference that will take place in December this year. Uh, this will be the first global in uh, agreement that will include all countries, both developed and developing, and mark the start of a new global approach to addressing climate change. In COP20 in Lima, the COP will outline important measures for adapting the climate change, which, which directly relate, relates to disaster risk reduction. These include decisions about financing, capacity building, and using risk information for national adaptation planning and related decisions. There is also the opportunity to align any emerging adaptation goals in the UNFCC with the post-2015 framework, as well as the post-2015 sustainable development goals. The stakes are very high. The impacts of climate change, such as increased droughts or more erratic storms, threaten to undermine, undermine decades of development gains and risks, future development trajectories. Even one degree of warming can cause rising sea levels and extreme events that can put governments, communities, businesses to the test. Economic losses from weather and climate-related disasters are already exceeding a million billion, a uh, hundred billion dollars uh, already annually. At the end of COP20, COP21 in 2015, will this, uh, it will convene in Paris, and it will aim at concluding an international agreement that stabilizes global temperatures at a two degree Celsius increase. To address the, the challenges of climate change measures must be taken on, ad uh, on adaptation to help countries and vulnerable populations build resilience and have the skills and resources to be prepared for the impacts of climate change miti and mitigation. These issues were among the issues that were recently discussed in the recent Secretary General sum Summit on Climate Change this September. Uh, this summit brought together the heads of states, CEOs from private sector, and leaders from the civil society. That was very subtle, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so this, uh, uh, the summit uh, really demonstrated readiness for the private sector, the local governments, and others to work together to set change in motion, financial commitments, uh, to capitalize the Green Climate Fund were made. More than a, a thousand companies pledged their support for e efforts to put a price on carbon and to pay for, e for each ton of, uh, of carbon emitted. So the issues of gender and climate change are also very pertinent and they were very, and they were highlighted at the, at the summit as well. And at, at UNDP, we've been working together with partners in the Global Gender and Climate Alliance, now an alliance of a uh, hundred organizations to really move the issue on gender and climate change. This is raising the issues uh, that are per pertinent for gender, what is important for women. As was mentioned by the other previous speaker, it's very important that we have women on the table because when what we realize is that the climate change has differentiated impacts on men and women, particularly in developing countries. And we when we bring them on the table, then they are able to really bring forth their, their needs, their priorities, and also their expertise on the table, and hence we are able to have better decisions. So I have examples of some of the work that we are doing to really bring the women on the table that perhaps I'll, men which I'll mention as we continue with the discussions. Thank you. Uh, 
um, some of uh, Lucy's comments in particular had me thinking about how when we talked about what's upcoming in 2015, we can also think about as we conclude 2014, we're talking about the 20th anniversary of the International Conference on Population and Development and how that factors into our discussions as well. Um, and I think Lucy brought up um, some other really important points that perhaps we can explore a little bit in the discussion, which include bringing different sectors and players to the table um, because this won't be what can we accomplish without factoring everybody in? Certainly we've been talking about women, but certain different sectors is also important. So now we're going to hear from our dear friend Clive, or my dear friend Clive Mutsunga. He's a family planning and environment technical off advisor at USAID. And he's going to dig a little deeper um, and talk to us a bit about population health environment programs, or PHE program programs, and talk to us about how they're gaining traction in global conversations such as as a cop. But where is that falling short and what can we do about that? Thank you, Clive. You can come here a little bit more about PHE at the Wilson Center on Tuesday. We're having a session if you are interested. Thank you, San Sandeep, and thank you, Aspen Institute, for the chance to be part of this discussion and to talk about an issue that is dear to my heart. So I'll just go and talk about what I've been told to do and talk about PHE, uh, which for those of you who haven't heard about PHE, is uh, the, full, the full name is Integrated Population Health and Environment. These are programs that have been implemented uh, for the last two decades in a number of places around the world with support from USID and other donors. And uh, the basic motivation of PHE projects or programs is that the drivers of extreme poverty are issues to do with poor health and sustainable use of resources, including biodiversity. Um, and also some of the population pressures are always interconnected. And addressing them in a joint manner is likely to be more efficient and pro uh, provide benefits across the board. So um, what we've learned from the two decades of our practice is that uh, these projects have had very uh, significant benefits and uh, they've led to significant health, conservation, livelihoods, water, hygiene and sanitation uh, benefits which could be more than just specific, uh, more than just implementing these projects in a in a in single sector basis, and what has been happening in the COP, for instance, in the uh, in the climate change arena, is it's good news for PHE. Let me kind of start by admitting that PHE, as a concept, has received great attention in the global conversations around climate change, but not explicitly. What we have seen is the growing recognition, both the evidence base, the policy, and also the program action to support uh, integration of population health and environment. Let me kind of clarify this. Earlier this year, for the first time, the IPCC, the International Panel, for climate change acknowledge the role of population dynamics and the role that they play, including access to family, voluntary family planning in really uh, building resilience to climate change. So we are seeing an era where there's more scientific evidence to show the links between population dynamics broadly, the role of family planning in building resilience to climate change. You also move towards the policy side and you get the, the fact that a number of countries, their own uh, national level country policymakers are making the links explicitly between rapid population growth and sustainable resource use and climate change adaptation. And this was evidenced by the national adaptation programs of action, which were documents that were prepared by least developed countries and submitted to the UNFCC, which kind of uh, summarizes priority adaptation actions that countries need to put in place to 
meet their most immediate and urgent needs. A majority of these documents recognized rapid population growth as an important factor that countries need to be aware of in terms of our climate change adaptation. A good number of these policy documents specifically mentioned family planning and investing in reproductive health as one sure way for building resilience and being a potential adaptation strategy. Two countries in these documents went ahead and proposed specific projects that uh, link women's reproductive health and family planning needs as important components of building their resilience and uh, increasing their resilience to, uh, to climate change effects. So um, by uh, making that sketch is to show that there is support from the science, the evidence base, both at the global level, the recognized uh, scientific pieces, but there's also support from the policy side, from uh, developing countries that are facing rapid population growth challenges, population pressures, and also high unmet need for family planning. So to me, that is a great opportunity to pitch in PHE, which is an approach that combines um, synergistic integration of population health and environment. Because it's just an, it's a programmatic approach, I feel that the science and the policy is there to really uh, provide an opportunity to use PHE programming in countries where these issues are are already being seen as a as a challenge, so that to me is a is an opportunity, and there's so much there's so much uh, support within the sustainable development goals, and there's so much support within the UNFCC, and it's a good thing that the two processes are likely to to merge, so it will provide it will be now for country program and po uh, program designers to really kind of make the leap which, is, which has been the challenge to connect the policy to program. So the PHE approach is a tested uh, program. The biggest challenge now will be really moving the next step of connecting the policies to the programs and uh, uh, hope for that PHE can be used as a model to get uh, all the issues around population health and environment tackled in a synergistic manner to really improve the lives and livelihoods of uh, millions of women around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Clive. Um, perhaps during the discussion, you can tell folks a bit about uh, your and our experience in Ethiopia in November. Um, I know the two of us, and perhaps some others in the room as well, had the opportunity to attend a PHE conference, which was um, not coincidentally uh, just a few days before the international conference on family planning. And so we had a, a good contingency of people um, representing PHE projects then move on to the discussion at the African Union around family planning. So perhaps you can share a bit more about that. Um, and Clive, as he was concluding, talked a, a bit about the need for PHE practitioners to take the le take the conversations to the policy level in their community. So we're now going to hear from Dr. Yet Aswa, who's the Vice President of Strategy and Impact in Gender Health, and she's going to take tell us a little bit more more about food security, climate change, and reproductive health, and how they intersect at the community level, and what does that mean for individuals, families, and communities. So thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Sandeep, and thank you, uh, the Aspen Institute, for organizing this uh, interesting conversation. Uh, I wanted uh, to start uh, uh, my point by saying that the policy label that uh, my uh, colleague Clive was saying is very important. The thing is, like, when you look things from the policy uh, perspective, it's a bit removed from the ground. And when you look at uh, who are the people making decisions at uh, 
the higher policy level. These are our leaders. These are our um, the heads of states, uh, the heads of big financial uh, institutions, such as the World Bank and IMF, and uh, the big donors. And uh, while they are a bit uh, removed from uh, uh, from what is actually happening on the ground and making decisions, policies, and priorities on behalf of the people that are actually living the life on the ground. These are the girls and the women and, and the main uh, and the marginalized. These are mostly the poor people and, and the voiceless. So as Clive said, it's very important like to bring these two perspectives together and however, um, uh, uh, focus the policy is when it comes to lives of women. They have faces, they have names, they have addresses. And whatever is happening at their level on the ground, on ground zero level, is impacting them not at the intersection. We are usually like talking about intersections, but it is like a hundred percent overlap at the ground level. There is no intersection at the ground level. But when we look at it at the policy level, we tend to compare, compartmentalize things and we say education, we say food security, we say environment, we say how are like these things addressed. But for the women, let me give you like a very practical example. For most women in rural uh, uh, developing countries, girls are forced into marrying a person they have never seen before. And they're basically like forced to start their traditional stereotypical roles of being just moms. That's it. So their contribution to other sectors is completely uh, not given much attention and recognition, and their humanity, their being human, is not at all recognized. So this is really like the most critical and the most foundational issue that's like missing from global discourses. So we need to bring the human right aspect. So. We have seen from uh, Dr. We have listened from Dr. Susan's presentation. Two hundred and twenty-two million women. What are they asking? The people at the policy level. They are asking where is the family planning, because they want to decide. They want to decide. I was able to decide on the number of children I have. I was able to decide on the frequency, on how many children I want to have. And that should not be. I mean, all of us here have that opportunity to make these life critical decisions. But for those millions of women who want to do the same, but are not enabled because of like for so many gaps at policy, structural, uh, societal uh, discrepancies, norms and values and culture related issues, they are not able like to meet their most basic needs. So that's what they are asking. And the policy makers who are usually like making deals and conventions and treaties behind closed doors must be able like to listen to what women are saying. It's as simple as that. But usually these decisions and policies are made without the consent, without the involvement, without the engagement of women, without the engagement of the youth, the young, population, we have a huge uh, uh, cohort of youth coming into the reproductive age. Again, we need to listen to what they are saying, what are their needs, where are the gaps, and be able to address that. So when we are addressing the reproductive health needs of uh, the reproductive health needs of uh, women and girls, we would be uh, uh, reaping the benefit on all on different uh, from different angles, be it from climate, be it from food security, be it from resiliency, and and uh, making sure that uh, we have a better world. Thank you.
Thank you. I think Yet really hit the nail on the head when she said the words human rights. I mean, as we're having this conversation today, I mean, we're talking about family planning and its relation to, as it relates to food security and resilience and sustainability, we are certainly talking about voluntary family planning services, and we are certainly not talking about imposing um, anything on any communities that isn't uh, wanted. Uh, we're now going to hear from Dr. Senin Huntan. Um, he's a senior reproductive health advisor at the technical division of UNFPA, so a, a key collaborator in all these discussions that we're having. Um, and he's going to talk a little bit more about Dr. Jim Kim's committed $200 million to the Sahel Women's Empowerment and Demographics Project and what that project is and how the, its partnership with UNFPA and the World, and the World Bank are if impacting the COP20 agenda. So thank you. Dr. Kim. Thank you very much. And Thanks, uh, Aspen Institute, for inviting the UNFPA. Uh, in fact, when I, I received uh, the invitation, uh, I was uh, very excited, uh, very excited because I'm from the Sahel region. Uh, I have worked there as medical doctor, practiced, uh, before I moved to WHO and now with UNFPA. So what I'm talking about here is something that I've lived through and I'm very passionate to talk about. Uh, you, regarding the, the Sahel project, the different dimension that my colleague mentioned here, girl education, women empowerment, human rights, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yet, for, for, for bringing the human rights uh, aspect. All these dimensions are reflected in this project uh, of the Sahel. Uh, there are two other dimensions that we haven't mentioned yet. One is migration of the population, and the other one is security. And in fact, uh, this project came as a result of uh, a call of action of the leaders of the Sahel uh, who recognized that uh, uh, population dynamic, uh, food, security, climate change, uh, and security, all these are interplay and needed to be addressed, not only from intersectoral uh, point of view, but also at the regional level. And so this project um, is covering six countries. Uh, most of you have probably heard about that. Um, those are Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, Mauritania, Chad, and Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, it's about 200,000 million. But what is really uh, interesting about this project is is using the IDA uh, grant that you know very much uh, with a combination of the loan and the grants uh, by supporting some of the key aspects that we are mentioned here. The project has three components. There is a, a, a first component that addresses demand for reproductive, uh, maternal, uh, uh, newborn, and child health aspect. So when we talk about girl education, when we talk about social norms, uh, those will be addressed through that uh, component. There is another component which mirrors the demand side, which is almost like the supply side. But really what it is looking at is building capacity uh, uh, on two uh, uh, aspects. One is the availability of the contraceptives in, in, those, in those countries, um, the harmonization of, and the regulation, uh, having a pool mechanism so that we can negotiate with the manufacturer and with a volume guarantee and bringing the price down in the region, uh, that will help us a lot. But when you think of who are the people who are going to deliver the services, uh, we are thinking of midwifery workforce. And in that region, particular region, uh, most of the midwives are retiring. Uh, we don't have uh, the inflows of uh, enough midwives. Those, are, those who are practicing are practicing in the urban area. So where we have uh, the, the much of the problem are in the rural area and you don't have the qualified health work, workforce to serve them. So this project is trying to build capacities not only to train uh, the trainers, but also to, to put in place what we call a rural pipeline uh, by which we will... Uh, uh, recruit, uh, train, and deploy 
uh, in remote areas so that they can serve uh, the community most in need and have a motivation system in place uh, that will enable them to stay and work there for a certain number of years before they, if they choose to, they can move. And then there is a third component which addresses the political aspect uh, uh, and also the accountability aspect, uh, developing capacity in the region so that uh, we can do, we can put in place some observatory of population dynamics in the region. There is an institution in the region called SILS, which is uh, doing that already and support, but there, there will be uh, strengthened and to do more. And then you want to have the political level to be committed. Uh, because this project, when you think about it, the amount is not that much for six countries. But what we are really excited about is we are starting seeing countries saying, OK, I want to put more money on that. I was in Mauritania with my bank colleagues, and the Minister of Finance said, no, oh, I'm going to fight within the government. And this envelope that we are putting through this project, we are going to double that. So those are the, the, the type of things that we are starting seeing and which keep us excited and, and telling us that uh, something is going to change. Um, in terms of partnership uh, with UNFPA, uh, we are very excited to be partner with the bank on this project as a, a UN agency uh, uh, with the mandate to uphold uh, the, the rights of the session and reproductive health rights uh, globally and uh, also to follow up on the, the program of, of action and you mentioned of the uh, ICPD. Uh, it, it, it brings home uh, all these messages and all these intervention that we, we've been talking about. So uh, we will be working closely with the colleague bank uh, to address that. Uh, and I wouldn't like to, to finish uh, without saying that uh, this project is actually going to have some tangible effect. If you look at the country proposal, most of them, nearly 40% are addressing girls' education, girls' empowerment, uh, making sure that uh, we can bring uh, 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 activity generating revenue for, for the women. Uh, I, I, I was looking at the proposal of Burkina Faso, and it reminded me of my own sister, uh, who dropped out of school because she got pregnant when she was in high school, uh, and making sure that adolescents can have access to contraception uh, will make them stay at, in school, will make them, like Dr. Uh, Suzanne Petroni was saying, becoming uh, uh, a productive member of society. Uh, and then that's what the project is about, and uh, uh, that's what is happening. In fact, there is a link that maybe some of you have, and I was, I was chatting with Carmen before we enter uh, this room, about the side event that we organized by the General Assembly, where the head of state they discussed about this project. If you haven't seen that, uh, this is uh, something that you, you may want to, to look at because the head of states uh, from uh, Cote d'Ivoire, from Chad, and from Niger, they spoke eloquently about their vision about their population and what they want to do through this project. Thank you. So we have um, a bit of time now for discussion, and I know that it's a it's a little um, perhaps a little challenging to see everybody. So before we turn it over to the audience, I want to um, I want to kick us off with a few questions. But uh, before I do that, I do want to acknowledge it uh, that you did um, uh, you did uh, mention uh, migration, and and we did hear a bit about population structure from. Um, or age structure um, from a, a Suzanne earlier, but you know there are so many elements of population dynamics that come into this conversation. I mean, for the purposes of this conversation, maybe urbanization isn't one that we'd have to delve um, that deeply into, but it is something to think about as we talk about the post-2015 development agenda across the board. Um, so perhaps now we can all stay up here at the table and turn on our microphones, um, but the first question I'd actually pose to all, any of you who might want to answer, but we, we We've talked a lot about um, the benefits to access to voluntary family planning services, and I mean, I know I'm certainly um, sold on seeing the connections between um, 
family planning and, and uh, food security and resilience and sustainability. But I'm I'm wondering what you all might see as to be as the biggest barriers to achieving a strong outcome document that might look at these intersections. So I don't know if anybody else in, anybody in particular wants to kick us off um, with that question around barriers. Please. Um, as uh, I see it, the biggest barrier is lack of a strong accountability mechanism. I think we have been here so many times. We have seen our leaders committing and recommitting and signing treaties after treaties and convention after convention. And then when the dates approach, the target keeps moving. So the dates are changing by decades or two. So we have seen that. So what is really like missing is putting in, in place a very strong accountability mechanism so that governments could really like honor their commitments, could be held accountable to what they have already like signed in treaties and conventions <laughs> so that governments could also like engage citizens. They should not be like on their own. They have to engage citizens. They have to engage the private sector as part of the solution. We have also like uh, accountability not only for the government, but accountability for the donors as well. Donors are also like pledging commitments, but again and again failing behind from honoring those commitments. And accountability of uh, the civil uh, society as well, holding governments and donors accountable to their com uh, commitments. So I would like to underline this. Thank you. Sure, Suzanne? Yeah, I want to I want to pick up on that. Um, governments have made some really outstanding statements and commitments at the international level on these issues. I mean, go back to the 1994 Cairo conference, um, where this was essentially the heart of the Cairo, Cairo agreement that governments recognize that in order to achieve sustainable development, you needed to put women and their rights at the heart of the discussion and your programming. Um, and specifically, they agreed that universal access to reproductive health was at the heart of sustainable development. We've just, I was up in New York for the, the 20th anniversary um, General Assembly special session on ICPD Beyond 20. I've watched very carefully over the past year as governments have come together to recommit or not to these goals. And it's really appalling um, how many governments have gone back on their commitments, have neglected these commitments, have forgotten that they've made these commitments, um, and really have forgotten the critical importance of focusing on women and girls at the center of sustainable development. We're now leading into the 20th anniversary of the Beijing conference, and I think those of us in civil society have to hold governments accountable to the commitments that they made in 1995 on these issues. We cannot let them get away with forgetting the importance of women and girls at the heart of these discussions. So as we lead into COP20, into Beijing plus 20, into the post-2015 final negotiations, we all need to stay firm and hold those governments accountable um, and advance the agenda. I mean, we're rolling backward in some, some areas, and we really cannot let that happen. Yeah, I mean, what I think, I, I, I believe you're talking about a strong outcome document from the COP in Lima. Mm -hmm. And I feel like what has been happening is that uh, the, the benefits and the links between uh, the issues that we are talking about have been, there's been a very strong push within the SDG process and less so within the climate change community. and. Probably it's an issue of timing where most of the work this year particularly has been very focused on the SDG. And given the fact that the SDGs are likely to be uh, starting early as soon as the outcome document is finalized by the Secretary General. And the challenge through the UNFCC is that uh, the outcome document either uh, building into Paris next year will be implemented in 2020. So. I feel like one of the barriers will be basically around the timing of the issue. And going into Lima, 
the discussion is mostly around financing, which is around the Green Climate Fund. And of course, the Green Climate Fund is going to be a very important source of uh, climate change uh, funding. So I think there's a great opportunity really to see how the fund and the links are kind of uh, strengthened to show, I mean, to make sure that the, the funding from the Green Climate Change does not preclude funding for the issue. So to me, it's more of a timing issue in the global policy processes and uh, with the global community kind of putting so much emphasis this year in the SDG and probably less in the UNFCC. And of course, the realization that the big, the big stake is next year when countries kind of come with a big deal in Paris. Sure, go ahead. Thank you very much. Just to build on that, I, we are hoping that the climate change decision right now that will be concluded in uh, Paris is going to be legally binding. I think that will make a, a difference. Where that's, so it's not just a commitment, but really it's legally binding to governments so that they are able to move it forward. But what I feel from my past experience to move this issue <coughs> it's very easy for it to be forgotten. So I think we need to keep an active advocacy, have a proper uh, monitoring and evaluation framework to ensure to track progress on the commitments that are made, and also uh, capacity building, particularly for the women that we place on the table so they are up to speed to the discussions and to the issues and really able to articulate the issues and follow up and ensure that the commitments are really followed up, the action that is taken really takes into account all these social and gender issues that we are proposing. So really in COP20, it's a, mainly a preparation towards COP21 in Paris where the decision will be made. So in this, there is need for the technical support and also to mobilize the political will because really for all these governments to agree with their different interests from the north, from the south, from the east, uh, for all of them to come and really agree together. The political will is really a challenge, and I think the summit really helped in building that momentum. Senator Senan, anything to add, perhaps, around political commitment, given some of what you were just talking about? It's, it's difficult when you, you follow all these distinguished <laughs> panelists. Uh, but there is, there is, from our perspective, one of the barriers remain the data. Uh, because in those negotiations, you are convincing sometimes people who uh, are, are difficult to convince. Um, and m being able to show those who are affected uh, uh, by the climate change um, is, is very important. And there is, for example, uh, uh, an initiative that we are doing with uh, UNIDO and other partners for the Maldives, uh, Trinidad, Tobago, etc., that we call Demographic uh, Explorer for Climate Adaptation, and that we will present, by the way, uh, uh, in, in Peru and going to Paris, which is showing how we can, see, we can demonstrate to, to polit polit policy makers uh, how climate change is affecting the most vulnerable. Uh, because, and, until you can you can show those who are affected uh, by by it and how unfair it is on, on the most vulnerable of the population, it might be difficult to push the agenda. So. I, I feel like you read my mind. Um, the next question I wanted to pose actually was around da data, and I was thinking perhaps Clive, you can talk to us a little bit about um, some of the maps that some of our partner organizations have done um, that look at the intersections between. Um, lack of access to family planning and uh, agricultural yields as a result of climate change. Again, you know the most about those maps that I'm referring to. Sure, I think I, I totally concur with that. Uh, data has been a challenge, of course. We appreciate that to really talk about climate change impacts, we are looking at uh, changes in weather for a uh, long period of time, more than 30 years. And we've not had a chance as a community really to uh, narrow down and say these are climate change. Some of it could be weather related or uh, weather, extreme weather events. But with that, I think the community has really gone a step ahead to 
use some of the data that is available to show how the issues are linked, whether at the spatial level or at the household data level. Uh, the particular piece that Sandeep is asking is uh, work that organizations like Population Action International have done to show to kind of map uh, areas of high population growth which are projected with uh, areas of um, high vulnerability climate change and projected decline in agricultural production overlaid by data around water stress or scarcity and then kind of mapping it to some of the specific population and family planning variables. And what that analysis has showed is that there are a number of population and climate change hotspots. And uh, the hotspots are defined as areas of the world where uh, this rapid population growth compounded by low resilience to climate change and I projected decline in agricultural production, but also windows of opportunity in that the unmet need for family planning, then a proportion of women would like to space or delay childbearing is very huge in most of the most of those countries, more than 20 percent, one in five women are willing or are wishing to postpone or delay childbearing, but not using a modern method of contraception. So there's some of that uh, data that has been done. And of course, the community needs to be more proactive to really get to the point where you produce the data to convince the policymakers to make, come up with good policies and programs to uh, address the issues. Thank you. Thank you. You know, before we do open it up to the audience, I, I feel like um, one thing that moderators are really bad about doing is seeing if the panelists have questions for each other. So I'm trying to make a commitment to make sure that I ask you all that in any sessions that I'm moderating. So does anybody have a question for, for each other? Or? Yes. OK. <laughs> well, I would just ask my neighbor. <laughs> Why did you come all the way here to speak about this issue? <laughs> what a question. <laughs> because I care about this issue. Because I am like, I came from Ethiopia. And uh, I had, I and my sisters uh, were privileged to be from uh, families that encourage us to aspire and dream and uh, give us like the opportunities to have access to education, access to resources. And because of that, that was really like a game changer for us, as for many people around the world. When girls are given the opportunity to go to education and are provided with like a safe environment to uh, go and, and, and do what they want to do. But for many girls, as I have already told you, for millions of girls in my own country and around the world, this is not the case. Many girls are forced into marriage when they are 13. I was in school, and I have never to worry about being uh, sent away to marrying a person that I don't know. Never, never worried. And every girl should have that access not to worry that she will be abducted, that she will be raped, that she will be like taken away, and then she will drop out of uh, education. Every girl should have that access. I believe in that. And when I wanted to marry, I got married. And every woman should have like that uh, decision-making power. And when I wanted to have children, I decided like the number, I decided when to space, I decided the type of contraceptives I want to use. And I had access to good maternity care. And these are like the most basic foundational uh, services and information that every woman, regardless of like where she is, whether she's in the United States or Ethiopia or India, must access. That's what I believe in, and that's why I'm here. Thank you very much. share um, why when you, you received the invitation from Ariana and her colleagues at the Aspen Institute you jumped on the opportunity? I can't follow that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, well, I do want to turn it over to the audience, but I actually have a question for an audience member. Um, so we're going to do this a little differently. I'm hoping that Carmen um, can talk to us a little bit about USAID's work around resilience in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, and then we'll kick it up, uh, kick it over yeah, to the questions. Yeah, and I would just ask when we do uh, when we do come to the questions, if you could use the mic, because um, this is being recorded, and we want to make sure that it gets captured, and also so that I we can see you, because it's a little hard. <laughs> sure. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Carmen coles -Tell. I work in the Office of Population and Health at USAID in the Global Health Bureau. I'm happy to be here as an audience member in the, in, on the panel today, and I just want to thank uh, the Aspen Institute and each of the panelists for your um, great remarks. And I think this panel has been very interesting. I wish you could replicate it in other fora. Um, so basically, I think in uh, 2013, um, resiliency in the Horn of Africa and in the Sahel became a priority for the Agency for International Development. And really, we started looking at an integrated approach to looking at issues of agriculture, governance, and health, um, and issues where we haven't traditionally taken an integrated approach. So I know historically, USA has supported population health and environment programs globally um, for the past two decades, as my colleague Clyde mentioned. But in issues of Sahel, sort of translating those lessons learned from our PhD programs um, to um, non-biodiverse areas, we hadn't really taken, moved in that direction. So we're, we're pleased to some extent with the work that we're doing in, in the Sahel. One area that needs sort of additional um, strengthening is our support to family planning in this integrated approach. Um, unfortunately, um, historically in, in the Sahel, um, the USAID doesn't have a robust uh, family planning reproductive health budget. We do support programs in Mali and Senegal, and we do have um, programs managed out of our regional mission. And we have been able to increase um, the budget going to the, to the region um, since 2008. But specific bilateral programs in many of the countries, like Niger and Burkina Faso, um, haven't been established since the 1990s. So looking at that, that's that's part of the reason that we have uh, entered into the Wagadu Partnership, sort of a collaboration with the Gates Foundation, Hewlett Foundation, as well as the government of France, the European World Bank are our partners as well, to look at how we can leverage and combine resources to strengthen the family planning component. What's nice about uh, resiliency as a framework within USAID, it's enabled us and opened the door for us to have high level um, conversations with other aspects of the agency. So um, we are a large bureaucracy, and I think we, you know, we have a tendency to have a, a stovepipe approach because that's how our money flows. But using resiliency as a framework, I think the leaders in our, in our leaders in our, in our DACHA office, the Office of, of Disaster Assistance, as well as our Bureau for Food Security, have really reached out to our colleagues in, in global health, as well as our regional mission colleagues, to look at how we can approach things in an integrated manner. And that has um, been very influential for us in the Office of Population and Reproductive Health because it gives us an opportunity um, to talk about our issues and, and how they're critical for development and how they're critical for the resilience of peace. Um, so we look forward. We we're very pleased with the World Bank UNFPA uh, announcement for their um, substantial resources that they're putting into the Sahel. And like uh, Dr. Sinan said, we were very impressed with the commitment expressed by the, the countries at the side event at UNGA last week. And we do think this is a critical moment for the Sahel, backed up by additional resources and by the political commitment to respond to the needs of the individual women um, and girls in, in that region. So I don't know if I'm happy to answer any questions or follow up by email. So thank you. Thank you. So how about any questions from the audience for our panelists? I certainly have a few more, but I do want to give you all the opportunity to. Hi, my name is John Henson, um, and I'm kind of talking on, uh, I do a number of different things, but uh, I'm talking from uh, my com own company, Paradigm Project, right now. Um, I also work with uh, Citizens Climate Lobby as well. Um, and uh, I actually had a question. Uh, this is wonderful. It, obviously, there's so many different contexts, um, you know, size of, of populations, areas, all of that. So, you know, this is a, a very broad question on that. 
But um, you know, one of the things that was attractive to me, obviously I work mostly in climate change and all the different aspects that relate to it, um, linking reproductive health, food security, and climate change. So I came in a few minutes late, I might have missed something. But um, I would love to hear a little bit more about the food security component, because we talked a lot about the critical issue of reproductive uh, of health and education and its impacts on human rights issues and, and all, all issues, population and uh, uh, migration, et cetera. But how are your different agencies um, and organizations and programs impacting um, local resiliency, really building resiliency education around food security? Excuse me, thank you. <coughs> we can collect a few questions or we can do them one by one. Why don't we collect another one um, and then we can open it up to the panelists. My name is Robert Nicholas with the AME Church's Service and Development Agency. I'd like to follow up that last question in the link between uh, extreme climate events and food security, if you would like to address these things. Any more? Okay. <laughs> My question is on reproductive health. Um, we talked about how all this money has come in and these women need it and these girls need it. I guess what I want to wrap my head around is how can we get the girls to know that they have the right to access to contraception and how difficult is that to get um, around cultural norms that they might be living with? Great. Oh, I forgot to say, I'm with World Moms Block. Oh, great. Um, so why don't we do this? Okay, we'll ask one more, and then we'll we'll go down the line. I think it's probably the easiest way. Hi there, I'm Preeti, and I'm with um, International Planned Parenthood Federation. Um, I just wanted to ask a question of the panelists around the linkages between women's unpaid reproductive labor, so care work, and how that links with issues such as food security, um, climate change, and particularly also women's um, empowerment and gender equality. Could you actually repeat, repeat it? I, I missed the first part of your yeah. question. So the linkages between um, unpaid reproductive labor, so care work, um, and uh, all the issues we're discussing today. Great, thank you. So um, since we don't necessarily have one question directed to one person, perhaps we can go down the panel and just uh, I'll remind folks we can t start with Suzanne. We have questions specifically around um, at the community level around resiliency and food security, L uh, question around links between extreme climate events and food security, um, then some more questions that look at women and girls, uh, specifically about how to educate about rights in, in keeping uh, cultural contexts in mind as well as um, looking at the linkages between uh, unpaid re reproductive work, so care, and uh, food security issues. So Suzanne, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, I'm tempted to answer all four questions, but I think I'm going to resist <laughs> we all know temptation you. <laughs> because we only have 15 minutes and we have a few other speakers who are we, we got sure. a few extra minutes, so um, we can go to 345. Well, I don't told, tell me. So. <laughs> um, I, I do want to share because there's some expertise that, and I have a feeling um, that the things that I would say about some of these things will be um, will be said, but if not, then maybe we'll come yeah, back. Yeah, it sounds good. Um, so let me let me tackle the the food security, resiliency, extreme climate, and so forth, and the the connections with women's rights and reproductive health. Um, women are the ones who are really the most directly affected by climate change and by extreme droughts and floods, for example, that, that will result as well as um, long-term changes in the climate that will affect crops, for example, that they, that they work on. So um, in terms of the extreme cases, we know from tsunami examples, for example, that um, women die at much higher rates than men in floods. They're not taught how to swim, how to climb trees. They're not allowed to go out and play um, as children, as girls, as their boys in their family. Um, and that, as well as other factors related to just their dress and, and the fact that they're um, less mobile has contributed to their increased deaths in, in tsunami disasters. That's just one example that I think is really stark in this regard. Um, as crops begin to fail because of changes in climate, Women are the ones, again, 60 to 80% of the farm workers in the world are women. 
they're the ones who are needing to adapt to changes in the types of crops that they can plant to understanding what types of crops are most nutritious for their families. They're the ones who will go into the forest and understand what seeds and nuts and berries and grasses are edible and can contribute to household nutrition. They're the ones who, much more than men, when they gather income from farming, from, uh, from labor, whatever type it is, reinvest that income in their household, in their children's health and welfare, in their children's nutrition. So they really need to be at the core of that. And in terms of the links with reproductive health, if women don't have access to reproductive health care and services, they will, they will have disabilities, they will have pregnancies, they will not be able to be out there contributing to, to their households um, as much as they would otherwise. So um, just two more quick examples along these, um, along these lines. Women walk on average in some countries two, three, four hours a day to collect firewood or water. And as changes in climate happens, uh, they'll be walking further and further. So their time in the house, their time to be on the farm, their time to take care of their children is affected by climate change. Um, there's one figure that just astounded me. Women in Sub-Saharan Africa spend 40 billion hours a year collecting water. That's the equivalent to the entire workforce in France in terms of labor productivity each year. So, you know, if you, if you can figure out ways to help women have access to water without needing to spend that much time, you're going to be able to spend that time um, and their productive labor in other ways. So again, focus on women in order to, to improve agricultural output, to understand um, how, how crops and foods and, and nutrition can be improved at the household level and up to the community level. I can understand why uh, some of those examples really resonated with you. I'm certainly not going to forget some of those stats either. Lucy? Thank you very much. I think I'll just build on by sharing my story why I'm here. <laughs> I think it il illustrates some of the figures that you mentioned and some answer some of the questions and the linkages. So I grew up in Kenya in the village, so I did fetch water for distances. Um, and then my, the first part of my career, over 10 years actually, was in the community as a community mobilizer, working on water and sanitation in rural areas. So I did witness women walking many kilometers to fetch water, to fetch firewood. And I also started witnessing the impacts of climate change when there were droughts, when there were floods, when the, the climate was unpredictable and the crops failed then you could really see the impact on the families and particularly on the women, the children. And also in another community that I worked on that was a pastoralist community, the livestock would also all die and it was the mainstay of the whole community. So this impacted entire communities and actually in these communities, men who are actually really had their self-esteem connected to the cattle really suffered a lot due to these impacts. So these impacts, are really interconnected. As I think the speaker from Ethiopia said, at the community level, these issues are not alien, are not separate. They are really very much interlinked. And when we address them, we have to be very careful that we address them together. I wanted to share the example of uh, an event that we had in Kenya earlier this year, where we worked together with grassroots communities to bring grassroots women leaders and national policymakers to really discuss the issues of climate change and disasters. So we brought together 10, 11 countries in Africa, and it was very, very uh, empowering to really see that the women, the grassroots women leaders, they are not waiting to be told what to do. They are already responding to climate change. They are already initiating, adapting, and even sharing innovations amongst themselves from renewable energy uh, uh, approaches to, to, to adapt to the issues of uh, lack of firewood, to issues of uh, sustainable agriculture, 
being able to conserve the environment, improve their livelihoods. So they really have practices that need support so that they can really grow and not only remain at the grassroots. And it was very no informative for them to speak to the national policymakers. And even I was, it was interesting to see some of the policymakers say they've never really heard from the grassroots and were actually surprised. So I think this is something that having worked at the grassroots myself and now working at UNDP at the global level, I feel it's very important for to bring these people together, these two levels together, to have us on a table where they can speak to each other. Because I think some change has to be catalyzed really by real action. Otherwise, we'll keep having things on paper, but we don't translate them into practice. So really bringing the right actors on the table, not the, the regular people, but people having conversations, people from the grassroots, from the policy, from the national, from the global level, coming together and being able to have these kind of conversations is very important. So that to address the issue of, of agriculture, particularly, and also uh, sustainable agriculture and um, food security issues, UNDP is in partnership now with Israel. As you know, the government of Israel is uh, very advanced in issues of um, technologies for uh, agribusiness and agriculture. So they are able to have technologies like drip irrigation that conserve water and be able to, to, to have high production and be able to market it properly. So we are, we've had trainings also earlier this year, we had trainings for uh, participants from six countries in the Horn of Africa where they are, they are having exposure to these trainings and seeing how they can farm uh, in an environmentally friendly way in conserving the environment, also improving their economic gains so they are able to not just remain at the grassroots but also be able to benefit throughout the value, pains, the value chains, access to markets and all these other issues uh, for sustainable development also to conserve and to be aware of what's happening in the climate change uh, and adapt to it. So these are some of the examples that really are simple but can be able to catalyze change. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'll follow up on the questions on the links between uh, family planning, reproductive health, and food security. And I would like to say that, yeah, I would like to say that conceptually there are many links between uh, family planning and food security. And uh, several of them are mediated by population growth. And uh, in some of these relationships are direct between food, I mean, uh, reproductive health, family planning, and food security. And others are mediated by a third factor, for instance, uh, poverty or women's empowerment. And we, I'll be happy to share with you resources that have recently done a review of all the evidence around linking family planning and reproductive health to kind of get to the, uh, to the latest scientific evidence. But of course, this one talks about how these issues are linked within the three elements of food security as defined around availability, access, and is it, accept, is it acceptability or affordability? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, for the issues around affordability, where incomes really and poverty play a big part, we know that more mouths to feed means, I mean, high fertility rate means more, uh, more mouths to feed. The, the, pro, the population is projected to grow from, let's say, seven, over 7 billion, where it is right now to 9.5 by 2050. So those are kind of clear links between family planning in terms of fertility and population growth and food security. But like uh, Suzanne mentioned, we also got to the point around women's empowerment. It, uh, things like breastfeeding and pregnancy may limit the ability of women to be engaged in agricultural production, which has direct links to the availability of food that's, that's uh, available for households to eat. So I think they are most of the links are, I mean, some of the links are more direct between uh, women being able to access or families being able to access because of family planning, use of fertility, and some of it, like I mentioned, are mediated by another, another factor, mostly uh, poverty and women's empowerment. Then 
I mean, like you asked uh, the question about unpaid labor. In most of these countries that we are talking about with rapid population growth, I mean, women are the main producers of food, and unpaid labor is, I mean, most of some of the studies that have been done show that in these countries, women provide more than 60% of labor. And it's not, doesn't come up in the national accounts. It's not, doesn't show as contribution in our national incomes. So it's undervalued and it's not, it doesn't seem as a contribution. So, I mean, really some of it is about getting to the point where the real value of women in uh, household agricultural production, which uh, contributes to food security, can be better captured. And then the question about how do you get girls to be empowered and to know their rights? I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a combination of factors. Education, like uh, it was mentioned, is a very critical aspect of it. Of course, the availability of the services, whether uh, they are reproductive health services and family planning is key. But as part of this is also the issue around social behavior change communication, which really, uh, with good targeted programs, you, you are able to really reach out to uh, women and girls and really uh, make the connection between the needs and the services that are available. So I think it's a, it's a combination of several uh, factors. Just to add a couple of uh, points on uh, the need to educate women uh, regarding like their rights. Uh, there is no one simple answer, but it's like a very important issue, and uh, we need to transform social norms to bring uh, a solution that is uh, far-reaching and on a, on a wider scale. Having said this, there are like many initiatives that are working. One is like the use of uh, frontline workers that are recruited from the community and serving the communities, mostly like women, be it like health extension workers or uh, community-based reproductive health agents or uh, agriculture extension workers. So they are already like trusted members of the community, so they could be the messengers for transformative uh, change uh, or social and behavioral uh, communication. That's one. The second thing is really like the need to engage men. We have uh, kind of like sidelined men for, for a while, but it is very important to engage men fully, men uh, in the households, but also men like religious leaders, the norm setters, the gatekeepers. We need to engage them in the conversations. And uh, really like to advocate men who are the champions and who are um, the models so that they can speak up and start setting this new norm. Uh, and the third element is for governments. So most of the governments have like good policies on paper in constitutions, but when it comes to enforcing that law on the ground, there is like a huge rift. So for governments really have like, to come up like, with a mechanism to enforce the law is very important. But then again, we have also like seen a huge improvement in uh, girls' primary education. The gap is almost closing there. So age-appropriate uh, reproductive health information should go to girls before they drop out of school and really make sure uh, girls continue to go like past the elementary, go to secondary, go to tertiary education. We need to work uh, along that line. Yes, I will, in fact, build on that. Um, there, there is no <clears throat> one-fit solution, like you were saying, but there is few things that we've learned along the way uh, from our female genital mutilation programs, for, from girls' education, child marriage program. You need a combination of factors. First, you need what my, uh, my colleague just mentioned from the government side. You need uh, to put social, behavioral, communication, education there uh, using appropriate channels to, to get to people. Because your question was, how do you get those girls to actually know that this is their right and exercise it? So we need also to put pressure on government. So what some of the things we, we do is to use civil society in the countries 
human rights organization in the countries, so that they keep putting pressure on the government uh, as duty bearer to, to, to uphold the rights of the citizen. But I, I, I was glad you mentioned uh, men in the Sahel, for example. Uh, there is this initiative that we have, we call Husband School. I don't know if you heard about it, uh, created in Niger and now spread out is in Cote d'Ivoire, is in Mauritania, everywhere. And those are concrete ways to, to put those stakeholders, uh, stakeholder, those gatekeepers, to actually become a champion uh, of, of uh, promoting the right of the girls and the women. Working with religious leaders, again, is so critical because we've understood that there could be a barrier. But we have now in the region, for example, and Mauritania is leading us in, in that uh, endeavor, of the Council of Religious Leaders, whether it is from the, the Christian side or even the, the Muslim side, producing how they could actually, it is like guidelines for priests or guidelines for imam on the intercession of family planning and Islam, family planning and Christianity. You see, HIV, all these issues that are, are very important to us about right, how we can use them as champions. Uh, <coughs> the, the, the last thing that I would like to, to maybe put there is the enforcement part. Uh, because during the Sahel event, a uh, side event by the GA, the president of Niger uh, was saying, uh, no, actually the president of Ivory Coast was saying, they want now to pursue the perpetrator of uh, the teachers who are impregnating girls in high school. Uh, this is something that uh, maybe in this part of the world is easy to conceive sexual harassment, etc. But in, in our part of the world, it's still something that we don't talk about a lot. And to hear from the president saying that this is not going to be tolerated anymore is, is a first step. And you need those kind of action. To, to, to reduce uh, those, uh, those uh, behavior. So that's need to happen. The parliament, who is voting the law and who is attributing the budget, uh, this is also one thing that you need to consider. So basically, you need a multi-pronged approach, making sure that all these stakeholders and gatekeepers are involved. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, uh, the last word also is from a policy point of view. You mentioned primary education We've, we've made a lot of progress, but to make it compulsory uh, has not yet been the case in many of our countries. And now we are having leaders saying that it will be compulsory to complete primary education. So you need to have those type of policy and commitment to follow through. Thank you very much. Any more quick pressing questions? Yes, please. Um, any more quick pressing questions or um, I do I do know we have those extra few minutes but I do also know that some of you are going to come up and speak to the speakers afterwards and claim you don't have a question now but you will do that <laughs> um, and I do know that some of them do need to, to get on the road so I do want to ask you all to join me in thanking them and then also encourage you to continue to have this conversation you know there's several of us that have blogs affiliated with our organization where we do look at the intersections between population and security. Um, so if we can continue, whether it's through comments or on Facebook or Twitter, um, these conversations I think would be very important. So again, thank you for joining us and thank you to all of our speakers.